Um, one of the things that we have to be able to do when it comes to healing is we have to be able to admit that, that we need it. You know, if you are a Christ follower, then you need to say, yes, I need healing. And what I mean by healing is physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, relational healing. But you need to be able to admit that. You know, you can admit it internally, quietly, but to be able to admit it publicly or, or admit it to God. Because if you're a Christ follower, then I hope that you come expectant. And, and maybe you, it's okay if you didn't. There's a lot going on during the week, you know. I can't remember what I preached on three weeks ago. I don't expect you guys to remember what's upcoming in the week. But I, just, I hope that maybe today, right now, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, Jesus is in your life, that you decide to be expectant, expectant for healing. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, that's okay. I, I don't expect you to be expectant for healing, and that is fine. We're happy that you're here. We hope you come back again. I hope that you enjoy being here. I hope that it's a safe environment for you. I hope it's been kind of fun and interesting to explore what this relationship with Jesus is like. But I, I definitely want to start out this morning because I'm going to talk a lot about my own personal life and my own personal search for healing. And so I would like to know that, okay, if I'm going to be open and honest, that maybe you guys can be open and honest. But this is a call of expectancy because I want you to be expectant. If you need healing for anything in your life, I just want you to raise your hand right now. Come on. Be bold. Don't be shy. Because if you need healing for something in your life and you're afraid to raise your hand then maybe, maybe not necessarily, because I want to be gentle, but maybe you're not ready for it. Because maybe you're not desperate enough. Because when we ask about it, and, and I, I want to speak to those of you that are just, you know, like, just discouraged. Because you've asked for healing over and over and over and over again. But it's just not come. The relief hasn't come. The pain is still there. You still feel it every day. You live with it. You walk with it. It's like your best friend. It's just always around you. And, and, that, and that gets very discouraging because you're like, God, why will you not take this for me? Why will you not heal me? Why, is, uh, why do we have things like cancer? Why are there things like starving kids in the world? Why, why all the war, the battle, like why on earth will you not help with all of this pain and all of this suffering that we have. I'm discouraged, God. And if you're discouraged, it's okay. I mean, I've, I've been there. And, and again, today I'm going to talk a lot about my own experiences. It's okay to be discouraged. But if you are, we got to deal with it today. So I just want you to admit it to yourself. All right. All right, God. I'm discouraged. Because you're not there. Or you've not shown up yet. I want to read to you a psalm because this is a psalm that I turned to so much when I was just desperate for healing, when I was desperate for peace and desperate for relief. And this is written by David, and David is in the cave. David had been chased by Saul, and he's, in the, he's hiding in a cave, and he's basically begging, like, God, come on. You know, and, and I want you to listen to these words because I, I think that this really maybe gives us some language for the pain, the suffering, for the need for healing that we go through here. And, and so let's look at what David says. And, and you can kind of take this as your own prayer. I know that as I read this day in, day out, over, over, over and over again, this became kind of my own prayer to God. God, I'm crying out to you. I lift up my voice boldly to beg you for mercy. I spill out my heart to you and I tell you all of my troubles. For when I was desperate and overwhelmed and about to give up, you were the only one there to help. You gave me a way of escaping from the hidden traps of my enemies. I look to my left and I look to my right to see if there is anyone who will help. But there is no one who takes notice of me. I have no hope of escape. And no one cares whether I live or die. So I cried out to you, Lord, my only hiding place, you're all that I have. My only hope in this life, my last chance for help. Please, please listen to my heart. Please listen to my heart's cry, for I am low 
and in desperate need for you. Rescue me from all those who persecute me, for I am no match for them. Bring me out of this dungeon so that I can declare your praise and all the righteousness will celebrate all the wonderful things that you've done for me. David's bargaining with God. God, if you'll do this for me, I'll celebrate you, all the righteousness that you have. You know, maybe this has given you some words, some words to your experience right now, your desire for healing, your desire uh, for relief, your desire to not feel the pain that you feel. Because I, I know that David has given me some of those words. You know, it's hard to, uh, it, it, you know, accept that God is good and that God is for us. And, and I, I just want to walk you through a little bit of logic here. Because if you're a skeptic, if you're sitting here, at, whether you're a Christ follower or not, and you're like, you know, okay, everything that you're going to say today, Chris, is great, but I'm still going to walk out of here hurting. And if that's you... I'm going to kind of make an argument for God being not a great God. Then I'm going to make an argument for God being a really good God. And at the end, we are going to have an opportunity to ask for healing and to get healing. So here's a little bit of logic for you. If God is, sorry, if God can't prevent evil, then he is not all powerful. So maybe you feel like your life's out of control and evil, let's also just call evil sin. Let's call evil hurt. Let's call evil pain. And if if God can't prevent that, then he's not all powerful. So why is God letting that happen in my life? Okay, let's look at the next kind of progression of this logic here. If God is not willing to prevent evil, so maybe he is able, but maybe he's not willing, then he cannot be all good. And then this progression of logic continues. If God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil exist? Why does God let it happen? You know, I, whether you are a Christian or whether you are not, you are going to have moments in your life, and, and for me, a lot of moments, where you just ask God, why do you let it happen? Why do you continue to let it happen? And, and it's okay to question the existence of God. In fact, it's easier to question the existence of God. It is. It was easier for me at a time in my life, really easy. It was super easy for me to say, I would rather not believe that God exists, that God is good, that God is real, than believe that he is and have to deal with and reconcile the fact that God does love me despite how I feel. And so I, I just made a decision, I'm walking around common, uh, 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 the, the commons, under a tree, talking to my wife, and I just said, I'm done. I just am going to choose to believe that God doesn't exist. Now, I knew that that wasn't true, but it was easy. It was way easier. And it, it did bring me some relief. You know, so the, the, this is a hard question to reconcile with, but... I want to show you how Christianity can make sense of and give meaning to and even offer a solution for the evil and for the suffering that we experience because it can. Believe it or not, the way that following God works and the way that God works in our life can make sense of it. So again, I use logic to create an argument for maybe that God is not good. And now I'm going to use logic to create an argument or or help you kind of wrap your head around the fact that God really is good. So many of us believe that uh, if I'm suffering, that there is no love in my life, that God doesn't love me. All right, that, that's something where, why would God let me con- to continue to hurt if he, if he loves me? Because if we love somebody, we don't willingly let them hurt. We don't let bad things happen to them. But that's not the truth. Because love and suffering, they do coexist. And here's why. If love is a choice, then suffering is always going to be a possibility because we can choose to love we can also choose to hate we can choose good we can also choose bad see if love is a choice then that means it has to be chosen and sometimes it's not chosen and because love is a choice there is always a possibility for suffering suffering is always going to be a possibility Now, this choice that we're talking about here, this choice is made possible by this thing called free will. This is a gift that God's given us. God gave us free will, and free will is the ability to choose. So why, you know, 
why would God give us free will? Why, why is that? You know, I think that God gives us free will because he wants us to choose to love him, to choose to love him as he is and to choose to love him like he is and to choose to love him for he is. Because how, how great is love if there is no choice? For God to be chosen to loved, it means something. Let me explain this to you. I'm going to talk about my kids a little bit today. Benjamin, our five-year-old, he comes running into church this morning. I was at the first time table before the first service. I was hanging out with Uncle Lionel. I, I love Uncle Lionel. He's such an amazing guy. I love just being around him. And so I thought, let me gravitate out to Uncle Lionel there and spend time with him. And while I was standing there, I heard my son's voice. And it said, he said, it's a five-year-old, he, he said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And he comes running all the way from the front door, all the way down to the first time table. And he comes running down and he wants to show me his, he's wearing a police outfit and he wants to show it to me. And, you know, I bend down, I give him a hug. Now that feeling in that moment, Daddy, 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 there is almost nothing that tops that and that beats that. And so how much more, if that's for me, when I go to God and I say, Daddy, 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 you know, how much more joy and meaning is that for God? Because if we didn't have you know, the, the choice, then what would that mean? So in, in fact, because we have choice, with choice, we also have the freedom to choose sin. And so with choice, we've got the freedom to choose evil. Because choice, God gave so that we can choose him. Because he wants us to be uh, in love with him. He wants to be chosen by us. So this is easy, very easy to illustrate. We know that there are things in our life that we do that are wrong and that are sinful. And we know that when we do those things, they hurt us. You know, uh, we know that pornography is not good for us. But yet we look at it. Many of us do. And we know that, that as we sit there and as the computer turns on or as we're ready to type in the website, we know when we go to that website that it is going to hurt us and it's not good for us. We know that we could choose not to look at it and we know that we could choose to look at it. And we choose to look at it because we have choice. And when we look at that, it hurts us. And then it hurts our relationships, either your future relationships or your current relationships. It puts unhealthy expectations on you and on a partner or a future partner. But it, it's toxic. It's cancerous. It, it, it's bad for you. It, but we have the choice and we choose the sin because choice also gives us the freedom to choose God. Now, if we wanted to get rid of evil and sin in the world, let's say we wanted to just wipe it all the way out, why would God let hurt happen? Why would we even need healing? Because he is God. He is the creator of, of, of all of us. There is nothing that is outside of God's control. Boy, that was hard to reconcile with for me. If nothing is outside of God's control, then why can't he just take away my pain? Why can't he just give me the healing? But in order for there to be no evil in the world, evil, sin, suffering, pain, then God would have to either remove our freedom to choose or he would have to remove us. See, we have to have choice. Choice is what gives meaning to love. Choice is what gives meaning to our relationship with God. But unfortunately, because of that choice, we also have brokenness in this world. Because all the way back to Adam and Eve, God gave them the free will to choose which fruit to eat. And they made the wrong choice. And it introduced sin into this world and they were booted out of the garden. But, I, you know, God and his love, even in that, even in that pain, even in that suffering, do you know why God kicked them out of the garden? Because God wanted them to die. Do you know why that's a good thing? It's a good thing because God knew that if they then ate from the tree of life, that they would live eternally in their sin. And God said, I'm going to give you a break from your sin. One day your life will come to an end. And then later I'm going to send my son to die on the cross for you. And then you're going to be restored into a relationship with me. See, I mean, God, the, the love to God is more than we can ever understand. But here, I'm going to talk about a lie that, that Satan, that the devil would love for us to think about. 
would love for us to believe. He wants you to believe in your life that if there's suffering in your life, you are not loved. He wants you to believe that because you suffer, then you are not loved by God. Now, again, I'm going to use my kids to disprove this right here. Every morning, Benjamin, our five-year-old, he has a light in his room. And this light automatically at six o'clock in the morning... I don't know, parents, if you've got early risers in your house, but every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, Benjamin wakes up. Well, it, his, his light turns from red to yellow. And when his light turns to yellow, he's allowed to get out of bed. But every morning, like clockwork, Benjamin tries to find some reason, some excuse, when he wakes up at 5 or 5.30 to try and get out of bed. And I watch him. I watch him on the monitor. And I see him poking his head up to see what color his light is. And I see him tossing and turning. And I can see that he is just absolutely suffering. So I go in his room and I tell him, I say, hey, it's not time to get up yet. You've got to stay in bed. You know, and, and, and it may be 5.30, it may be 5.55, it may be five minutes away from his light coming on. But I just lie to him. I just tell him, hey, it's three o'clock in the morning, you know. Everybody's asleep. There's nothing going on out there. This morning he got up, uh, woke up at 5.30. He wanted to sing. I walk in his room and I'm like, Jim, man, you, you got to go to bed. You got to go back to sleep. And he says, yeah, but dad, I just want to sing. And I'm like, well, too bad. Sing when your light comes on, Right. <laughs> And it, he only had like 30 minutes left. But I was like, it's the middle of the night. You've got forever, you know, just let your expectations die. But that, that yeah, that's, that's good parenting. So he was suffering, but he was loved. So we discipline our kids because when we discipline our kids, we know that there is something better on the other side of that. Something better is coming. So we, we go through some suffering with love attached to it because there is something better coming, something better on the other side of it. We want our, our kids to grow up and to be, you know, contributing adults, to have good character, strong character. And so we make them endure a kind of a version of suffering because we believe that there's something better for them coming in the future. Now, this does not mean that the suffering you're going through, that the healing that you're desiring does not come with an enormous amount of pain. You know, Benjamin doesn't experience pain when he wants to get out of bed early in the morning. But a lot of you are experiencing an enormous amount of pain. And I, I, I went through that for like four years. I dealt with daily, daily pain. My anxiety was so high, my depression was rising and rising and rising. I felt like that I could feel my body dying on the inside one cell at a time. And every cell that died, it was incredibly, incredibly painful. And, and in that time, you know, I, there were moments where I would run a bath and lay in the bath and just to put my head underwater, just to drown out the rest of the world and drown out the pain that I was going through. And I would ask God, why are you allowing me to hurt like this? And I would call out to him and I would say, it's too much for me to carry. It's too much of a burden. You tell me that the yoke is easy and the burden is light. It's not, God. I can't deal with this anymore. Take it off my shoulders. Just take it away from me, please. I wake up in the morning in immense pain. Pain from anxiety, pain from depression, pain from not understanding why God would let me con to continue to go through this. And then I would, I, would, I would go all day with that. Would start my day off on my knees just begging God, could you take it from me today? God, could I have, you know, uh, there was a time where I stopped asking for healing. And I just said, can you give me a, a minute of relief? Can I just have, can I experience one minute of relief? And it, it never came. God never answered that prayer. But there, there is purpose to your pain. I'm not saying that my pain is greater than anything you've gone through. I, I want to honor and respect those of you because, I mean, I'm extremely privileged. You know, I just want to admit that. Unbelievably privileged. And I know some of you are going through an incredible, incredible amount of pain. So I, I want to respect that. But I, I can't speak from your uh, from your circumstances or from the experiences that you're going through. I can only speak through mine and hope that there's something in there that you can learn from. But there's purpose in your pain. In fact, 
sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. This is a hard truth to understand. So I would love just to tell you that today at the end of the service, you can raise your hand and you can say, God, heal me and take away all of my pain and that God will just take it away. I would love to say that. That would be amazing. Our church would grow and people would, would come and there'd just be like revival that would break out. And yeah, man, amen, praise Jesus. But that would be such a, a, a lie to you because that's not the plan for all of you. For some of you, it is, it may be. But for all of you, for, for all of you, it's not. For the majority of us, God's preparation comes packaged as pain. What is it that God's preparing you for? You know, I would tell God all the time, God, stop preparing me. I'm done. Don't prepare me for anything. Just let me go. Leave me alone. But, but there is so much value in pain. There is. And I'm sorry to say that. I am. I'm so sorry that you have to hear that. But it is the truth. Here's what your pain and your, your unhealed uh, prayer requests. Here, here's what those things can do for you. Let me show you a statement that I turn to all the time. Suffering causes our focus to turn inward, which it does. It makes us go inward big time to face those parts of ourselves that we might otherwise ignore. See, when life is good, it's like, hey, life is good. I don't think about anything. I'm just out enjoying this amazing life. But when life is not good, when we're suffering, uh, man, we turn inward and we start dealing with this. We start dealing with ourselves. We deal with our expectations, our brokenness. We start begging God. We start exploring God. We start asking God where he's at. We start asking all these questions that we would otherwise never ask. When the bank account is good, when you got a lot going on, when the relationships are good, nobody ever walks around and says, God, where are you? Why aren't you working in my life more? Why aren't you uh, doing this thing for me? You know, God, I need you. No one, we, rarely, some of us do. We, we say, God, I need you and things are good. But when we're suffering, our voices get loud to God. And our desires, our ask, our prayer requests, they get loud to God. But God can use suffering then to develop us into better people, the people who can love and enjoy him forever. Now, this is a hard, hard truth. Again, I, I can't tell you that God's just automatically going to heal you today because there's purpose for a lot of your pain. And honestly, I don't want you to skip what God wants to do in your life through your suffering because your unanswered prayer requests for healing can do more for you than a lot of your answered prayer requests. You know, I went four or five years living through unanswered prayer requests, but I can tell you now that if I were to take all the seasons of my life and break my life up into seasons, the one season that I really would want to keep was the worst, most painful season that I had because it changed me. It fundamentally changed me. See, if we just got everything that we asked for, if we just got the healing that we wanted when we wanted it, then we wouldn't learn the lessons. We wouldn't experience the change and we wouldn't experience the growth that God has for us. Let me give you an example of a tree. An oak tree was growing on a couple different hillsides. There was a group, a grove of oak trees. And some of these oak trees, as they were growing up from seeds, they didn't experience things like the wind or the cold. They were sheltered from those things. And as they grew, they grew weak. They didn't need the root system. So the root system didn't grow. One day a wind came along and it blew them down. But then on the other side of the hill, on the other side of the mountain, the wind was fierce. And those oak trees sprouted seeds. And because the wind was fierce, their roots took root deeper and deeper and deeper. And they spread out wider, wider and wider. And those oak trees grew to be able to withstand the wind and the weather to not be knocked down. See, God, God has purpose for your pain. He has suffering, and it is to make you better. It's to grow you. It's to, to develop you. And for me to say that everyone in here is just going to get healed today is also to say that everyone in here, maybe some of you in here are going to miss out on what God has for you through your suffering and again, this is not just me talking a, a, a Bible thing. I lived this. I went through this. I still live this. I still go through this. 
And if you raise your hand saying, I need healing, then you're also going through this. But I want you to ask yourself, you, you, we have to deal with this. You have to deal with your unanswered prayer requests, with your suffering and with your need for healing. You have to deal with it. You have to ask these questions. God, where are you? God, what are you doing? And you have to ask yourself the question, could there be purpose for my pain? Could my pain be preparation? Paul in, in Romans, he's, he's writing, and Paul and Peter take a very kind of uh, like point blank stance on suffering because they know that, that there's purpose to it. They know that the pain has purpose. And in Romans, Paul's writing a, a, a letter, and he takes kind of this statement here that we're talking about with suffering and how it develops you, how it turns you inward, how it makes you a stronger person. He's, he's taking this, he's unpacking it. So here's the, the biblical response or the backing to that statement that I just read you. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, And not only this, but with joy, let us exult in sufferings and rejoice in our hearts. You know, when I read that, I think, how dare you, God? How dare you ask me to with joy exalt in my sufferings and rejoice in my heart? How, God, do you not know how much it hurts? Do you not know how bad this is? Do you not know how desperately I have asked you for healing, for help? Okay, and, and you want me to exalt you for this? How, how dare you do this in my life? See, that, that's, that's all, that was my response. If that's your response, welcome to the club. I also want you to know like, you're human, and it's okay, as long as you begin to deal with this. Now, Paul goes on to tell us the purpose in this here, and he says, knowing that hardship, distress, pressure, and trouble, it produces patient endurance, and endurance, proven character, spiritual maturity. He goes on and he says, and proven character produces hope and confident assurance of eternal salvation. See, Paul is talking about not your healing being answered, not your pain being taken away, but he's talking about the thing that matters the most to God, and that's your eternity. And Paul is saying that there is healing for that. And that is a healing that is guaranteed. And then in verse 5, Paul goes on and he says, Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, I, I want to proclaim to you what the Bible says and what Paul is saying. Paul is a God that suffered unlike the majority of us ever could suffer. And, and, and Paul is a guy who then tells you that, hey, there's purpose to your pain here. And it produces good things in you. And the result of what it could produce in you is so good that it sets your soul and your eternity forever. That yes, this may hurt, this may be painful, but this is like this compared to the eternity that comes for us in the future. Now, in the same breath, I also want to recognize that when you're really hurting, none of this means anything. None of this, like, counts for anything. And, and, and that's why I say that today I'm challenging you, I'm asking you to deal with this and to ask these hard questions and to ask yourself, is this uh, with a purpose? Because the presence of pain does not equal the absence of love. That's a truth that I hope you can accept. The presence of pain does not equal an absence of love. We think that it does. As I laid a, on an office floor in a side room in a house in Newlands, on my knees, on my side, that presence of pain, it was easy for me to think, well, God doesn't love me, but that love was there. That day that I walked under a tree um, around the common, Rondebosch Common, and I said, you know what, it's just easier for me not to believe in God. When I look back on that, I know that in that moment, God was hugging me even tighter. God was there with me. God's heart was breaking for me. In fact, in, in the, the, the Bible, there's the, the event where Lazarus dies. And Martha and Mary had called for Jesus. Jesus, come, because you can heal Lazarus, because Jesus is the healer, but he doesn't come. 
And Lazarus dies and he's put into a tomb and people are mourning. And then Jesus shows up and they say, where, where were you? Do you, I mean, I, I could, the Bible doesn't say this, but, but I could really imagine Mary saying, don't you love me? Don't you love Lazarus? Don't you love us? I thought you were the healer. Why did you not heal? And you know what Jesus does? In the presence of that pain there, Jesus cries. He weeps because it hurts his heart. And there is love there. And out of the love for them and out of Jesus being moved by what he saw, he raised Lazarus. Because there is love even in the presence of your pain. I'm here to tell you now, even though you may not be able to believe it or accept it, that there is love in the presence of your pain. And it is the love of God. You know, there was um, one man who was sent to earth who dealt with an enormous amount of pain. And yet there was so much love in what he did. John 3, 16, this is a, a verse that unpacks this for us. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son. See, Jesus came down out of the presence of God, out of the throne room of God. He came down and he took on uh, human form. He gained the ability to hurt. He gained the ability to weep. He gained the ability to feel pain. And then he was betrayed by his own. And, and he was put on a cross to die a horrendous death. And on that cross in the middle of the humility and the shame and people making fun of him and, and the beating that he had taken and the, and the breath that he was trying to keep in his lungs, he says, Father, forgive them for they know what they are doing. And also in that moment, Jesus, as he was getting ready to take his last breath, he experienced the total separation from God because he took on all of our sin. And then he gave up his last breath and he died. The one perfect person on this earth took on the greatest amount of suffering and he did it for love. And the reason that God, whose heart breaks for his son in that moment, the reason that God did that is because he knew that something better is coming. See, the better thing that was coming after that was salvation. And Jesus knew that and God knew that because, where, because God and Jesus, they were one, one with each other. But where there was pain, there was love. And because of that love, there is salvation. Something better was coming. Something better in your life is coming through your pain. I promise you. I, I should not be up here today. I, I should not be. I shouldn't even be alive today. It's not an education that qualifies me to be here. Many of you guys are way smarter than I am. You know the Bible way more than I do. It's not, it's not my, my background or my Bible knowledge that qualifies me to be here. It's not speaking skills or the ability to run a church. It's none of that stuff. In fact, when Casey and I became pastors here at the church, I had only preached like three times. I wasn't even a preacher. I couldn't even preach. I was coming down here during lockdown and setting up TVs around the room and coming on a Saturday night and trying to figure this whole thing out. And I didn't know how to do it. That is not what qualifies me to be here. What qualifies me to be here is that I went through the deepest, darkest time of my life. And I learned through that time that God never left me. That my pain was the preparation that qualified me to be here for this. And that brings up something that was really hard for me to learn that I need you to deal with, I need you to consider. See, our definition of healing and relief is different from God's because we just want it to go away. We just want it to be taken care of. But God's may be different from that. And what that comes down to is that comes down to our perspective. See, God has a perspective for our healing because he can see all of my life that when I was asking God for healing, for a break, for relief, my perspective of healing was take it away now. Give me a break now. God's perspective was, Chris, I have something so great for you. I have for you the ability to have your personality, your soul, everything about you changed, softened, uh, made different. 
I have the ability to create burdens in you that you never had. I have a vision for you, Chris, to be a totally different person. And it's all so that you can experience my love day in and day out and day in and day out. See, God's perspective was so different from mine. And I am so glad that he did not answer those prayers when I prayed them and that he walked me through a season of suffering and pain. Your healing, your suffering, your pain, it comes with a purpose. Like I said, some of you, the purpose today may be that you experience just instant healing, cancer, gone, heartache, gone, emotional trauma, gone, trauma from abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, today, gone, healed. For some of you, that's God's perspective of your healing today. But for some of us, God's perspective is that something greater is coming. I want to share a verse for you that I turn to like every single day. And every day I would read this and it was just a reminder for me. I spoke this over my life every day. Rarely did I believe it, but I thought to myself, if I just speak it out loud, then over time it could just continue to soak in. And so you can go to this, Philippians 4, 12 through 13. This is the Amplified Translation. I love this translation of this verse. And it says, this is Paul talking here. And, and Paul is about to give us a secret. He's going to give me and you the secret to dealing with the hard times, to dealing with the unanswered prayers, the unanswered prayers of pain. Because he says in verse 12, for I know, he's talking to the church in Philippi, for I know how to get along and live humbly. I know how to do it in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. Any and every, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. Well, I would like to know the secret of this, the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. Some of us have literally not been fed because our suffering is that bad. Our situation is that dire. Some of us have been in such a great need that you don't know how tomorrow is going to come. Just like David in the cave. Some of us have been in such an emotional and physical need that we just don't know how we're going to do it. How we're going to confront that person. How we're going to wake up and get out of bed and walk into the office or walk into the family home. Some of us have been there. But Paul is saying, hey guys, I know how to do it when it's good. And I know how to do it when it's bad. He doesn't say, I know how to automatically get healing for everything that goes wrong in my life. He says, I know how to live when I have abundance and I know how to live when there's great need. I know the secret. And so the secret is this in verse 13. Paul says, I can do all things which he has called me to do. That's the qualifier. Everything that God has spoken over your life every character trait, every personality trait, every passion, every desire, every calling, what God has called you to be as a mother, as a father, as a husband, what God has called you to be as a wife, what God has called you to be in your singleness, what God has called you to be as a child, as a grandparent, what God has called you to be and to do, you can do all those things because it's him who strengthens and empowers me. And I would just read that line over and over again. God strengthens me. He empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. See, in, in, the, in the bottom of your barrel, when you're at the bottom of your barrel, when you're at the bottom of the well, when there's no more water to pull up, when there's nothing in you that you can draw on, when you are completely inefficient and insufficient and you've got nothing going on, you've got nothing in your life to lean on. When you're at the bottom and you're laying on the ground in the fetal position saying, God, I can't take it anymore. Why won't you heal me? Why won't you take this from me? You don't have to be sufficient in that moment. You don't have to be self-sufficient because even in that moment, Christ's sufficiency is enough for you. Now, it may not look like you want it to look, but in my life, it was enough because I'm still alive. Because there was a time when I thought about making the choice to not be alive. Because I, I had no sufficiency left in me. But Christ's sufficiency was enough. Paul goes on and he says, I am ready for anything. Anything. And I'm equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength 
and confident peace. And today, I can't promise you healing for everything. Some of you may receive it, some of you may not. But what I can promise you is healing for one thing, and that's your soul and your eternity. See, I can promise you that today, with the confession and with the prayer and an invitation, that you can be infused with inner strength and confident peace. Infused is in a tea bag and water. You can't separate the tea from the water again. It's infused. I gave my life to Jesus, and even through my insufficiency and my hard times, I'm still infused with inner strength and confident peace. And I know that because I'm here. And so we're going to put a prayer of salvation on the screen here, and I'm going to lead us in prayer. And if you don't know where you're going when you die, if you don't know about your, your, your eternity, if you don't know about that, Because that's the one thing that Paul, it's the one thing that Peter, it's the one thing that Jesus was the most focused on. Everywhere that Jesus healed somebody physically, uh, he, he healed them spiritually as well. He forgave their sins. Even people that didn't ask for forgiveness, Jesus did it for them anyway because the thing that he cares the most about is your soul, your heart, your eternity. And today's the day where you can secure that. Secure it forever. And so I'm going to ask you here in just a moment to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're new here, here's how this works here. We're trying this. This is, this is, we're just trying this out. This is a prayer of salvation. There's no magic in the words, but it's quite helpful to have something to go by, to have something to guide you. And so that's what this is. So you're free to bow your head, close your eyes to maybe pray that prayer in your heart and your mind. You're also free to open your eyes and to lift your head up. Because we're not going to ask you to raise a hand or anything. And you can read along with us as we pray this prayer. So here's how your eternity gets set forever. Because you pray the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I know my sin should separate me from you forever. I believe in your son Jesus. I believe he died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so that I can live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.